Hi there. This is the Lean Into Artcast, the show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and engage with visual storytelling topics and, uh, you know, think about it from a practical standpoint. How do we do the stuff that we do? And then back away and look at how do we think about the stuff that we do when we're doing it? Because after all, we want to think hard about visual storytelling, so you will too. My name is Jersey Droz, cartoonist and teaching artist. The other host is... Hey, I'm Rob Stenzinger, a UX and game designer. How's it going, Jersey? It's going okay. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's summertime, and in the United States... Uh, summertime is big movie time. You know, the, the summer blockbuster thing that's been around for like 40 years now, right? Um, it's part of our yearly. So experience. it has, yeah. And uh, we both recently went to see some superhero movies because those are, strangely enough, like all the rage now. <laughs> As a kid, I never would have thought that this day would come, but here we are in, a, in an age where um, I recently watched... Uh, the Captain America Civil War movie on Netflix. And I was as I was watching, I was like, well, oh, this is asking me to remember an awful lot from previous movies. This is getting to be a lot like reading a comic book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they just keep coming and they keep keep uh, referring to one another. But um, but that's not the, the topic for today. But um, I was wondering if we could maybe start with what we saw and why we're thinking about what we're thinking about today. Oh yeah, totally. Uh, I mean, for me, I I went I went to a movie with with my wife Kate, and uh, we saw Wonder Woman. Finally, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it was high on our list, and finally the stars aligned, and you know, babysitting arrangements were there, and and uh, you know, we we made it to 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 check that out, and it was uh, it was fantastic, and aspects some choices in that movie we're not going to do any spoilers in this episode but Are like i it, this is all spoiler free but i what i took away from it was what a fantastic hero's journey and what nice twists and spices and uh and it, it was um yeah an enjoyable excellent execution right which it which it obviously would have its own um Hmm. It's not. It's not going to be a samey sort of thing, right? Someone. Someone's going to be like, "Hey, here's this is a hero going on going on their journey and going through stages, right? Where we're 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 thinking of the hero's journey today. So we'll talk about different, you know, what what's the progression of that and what's that about? Um, and I inherently had a bunch of reactions on that movie that immediately had me just excited about that sort of format. Um, mm. Like seeing a really skillful guitarist in a certain point and they, they, you know, it's like, okay, now I'm going to think about that because it really connected. Yeah. And I, I saw Spider-Man Homecoming um, with my wife, Anne, and Anne had already seen Wonder Woman uh, with some other friends. So it, when it came to like a toss up, like, which do you want to see? I'm like, well, you know, Anne, you already saw Wonder Woman. So why don't we go see Spider-Man? I'll go see Wonder Woman some other way. Um, and again, no spoilers, but uh, I walked out of that theater thinking like, I think I just saw my second favorite superhero movie of all time, um, right, right underneath the 1979 Superman movie. Um, and I, and I, and I, I walked out of the first Spider-Man movie, you know, the one with Tobey Maguire. I mean, I was like, I was like, Oh, Ooh. I'm so uncomfortable. I'm so unhappy. This is not for me. I I'm glad it's making all these people happy, but I can't sit through this anymore. <laughs> and I walked mm. out. Um, I, I was probably less, less charitable because I was a younger man, but, um, but uh yeah so i walked into this thing with like really low expectations like yes eh, look the suit looks nice and the kid seems likable and everything but man i was not ready for how much that movie would affect me um hmm. and so i have i it's interesting that you pitched this topic at me because i really hadn't spent any time unboxing that spider-man movie for myself to figure out like what triggers it was pulling i was just like enjoying the fact that i had uh, that I was taken for a ride emotionally for a change, you know? Um, but I, I do think I need to go back and unpack a little bit about what what, what was so good about it for me. Um, ah, right. Which so we're maybe, not going to do on the show. Nope, not going to happen on the show. There is a risk that we may talk about some older movies, right? Yes. So there could be spoilers. So I, I, I guess it's not quite accurate uh, to say that there will be none. We've got some older ones we we may use as as an example, but nothing that's very recent. I would say 
I mean, maybe 10 years old-ish, eight years, somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah, and, or even older in some cases. Or like way older. We started. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, do, do we? How about this? Do we want to do a, a service to the to the leaners and just like buckshot the titles that we plan on talking about? So then, if anybody's oh. like, "Oh, I don't want to know how that one turns out," I'm still waiting to see it. They can just Good shut this point. one off. Excellent point. Um, okay, so there's this one movie that happened. It's like this outer space thing, and it's got it just it's just two really plain words: Star Wars. Right? Oh, I thought you were gonna say Ice Pirates. But you meant Star Wars, okay? <laughs> Ice Pirates. I have not seen Ice Pirate. Ice Pirates. I've heard it's good though. I don't know. So, uh, but feel free to bring up Ice Pirates. Um, so another one would be put potentially the um, uh, the first Iron Man. Mm-hmm. Right? I saw uh, that. Yeah, and an- another one that's just a huge movie for me personally is uh, Princess Mononoke. That is so interesting. Like my friends tend to fall into two camps. Like the people who like love Princess Mononoke, like and um, uh, what's what's Nausicaa? Uh, like that's their preferred milieu for the Miyazaki films. And then there's the people who just want the like the, the quiet ones with kids on bikes or or women looking at like subways uh, or like trains in the distance, uh, like only yesterday or Kiki's delivery service and stuff. Hmm. Uh, hmm. I okay. So you you put my favorite and worst um, Miyazaki films in the same sentence, as what? far as the um, Nausicaa and yeah. Princess Mononoke. Um, like the the Nausicaa movie, I've, I've, I have I have a hard time with. And oh, maybe really? I, I, yeah, oh my god, it's I have big problems with that one <laughs> because I'm a giant fan of the uh, the manga, right? So yeah. like I have a little four book set that uh is it is deeply affecting in a wonderful epic journey that the movie um i yeah it, i i would say that it's you know it's generous that the movie's telling a different story so maybe i need to check that out with fresh eyes at some point mm. hmm. but uh but there was various things that that like yeah yeah i it's tough to go into that one but I'll, I'll just call that, you know, that's it's it, let's call that hashtag Rob's baggage. <laughs> Prin- Princess Mononoke, quite the opposite. I I have read the the manga of Nausicaa, and yes, you're right. It, it is a very dense, very intense manga, and there's no way all of that was going to make it into a two hour or less story, right? <sighs> okay, you could take the essential truth about different characters, though. And have them go through, go through an arc, some kind of transformation. They're like, and mm, I don't know what to let out. It yeah, hurts. yeah. Are you talking about like the the bad queens, like sort of second in command, the dude with the beard? He has an awesome arc. Yes, he does. It's a fantastic arc in the book. Yeah, it's, or, it's and, really not much more than like a sardonic sidekick in the movie. Yeah. <sighs> That that and that is merely one of the crimes of the movie, of which it has many. And I, it's my understanding that that was a whole pro, like maybe a bit of an unhealthy project mm-hmm. for uh, in a in a variety of ways. I think that the initial movie had, had it was sort of a earlier in how Mi, Miyazaki's career that as far as getting the right funding to pull it off, that was a that's a bit of it too. And then then I think some of it could be in the the um the english translate translation as well so could be a you know falling off the tree and hitting a couple of branches i don't know mm. but um i just i just like it when you get passionate about something i mean I, i'm sorry I, I don't mean to be laughing at, at your pain but uh it's it's always interesting to hear rob get opinionated on something oh uh, well and honestly because i i i don't want to act out of grumpiness i don't and and that movie gets it, it Oh, there's a lot to be grumpy about with that movie. Like, it's so bad. See, this, okay, so let me just say this. This is why people should come uh, to events where we are, like at things like at A2CAF or things like IO Festival, because then you can get yeah. us like off the mic and you can hear us get angry about things. Like at A2CAF, Zach and I had this long conversation about sound design where I was shouting. I was <gasps> shouting. Oh, I was so angry. And I apologize to other people in the room because they were not ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> like, yeah, I'm going to get grumpy about this real quick. Everybody just hold on and then I'll get it on my system and then we can go on with our lives. But Well, and yeah, I mean, everyone has, has, um, I mean, that that's about having, let's see this, this is not a platform for that. I don't typically put yeah. publish stuff as a, you know, I'll have conversations and, and, you know, yeah. in, in the right context that, uh, that open up to other things where I'm like, yeah, I'm about to be not constructive for a while. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah. Right. And uh, that's anyway, that's awesome. So great. There's great a time plug. and place for that though. Totally. And, but that's not now. That's not now. So Princess um, Mononoke will You added a, a movie to this list. Too. Yeah. I, I added Monsters Inc. Cause I think there's like some things in the pieces that you captured for talking about uh, that. I think that movie does like very loudly. Mm. Uh, for better or worse, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't have a really strong opinion on it, but it's like a really good example to talk about that kind of thing. Um, mm. So Hero's Journey. Hero's Journey, that thing that uh, many of us involved in. Uh, oh, and Shadowing Tronics is asking in the chat about which dub did you see of Nausicaa? And he said, I hear the recent recent one is better than Warriors of the Wind. We'll hang on to that. We'll hang on to that for future discussion about it. <laughs> Totally interesting. I would need to dig it off. The DVD is on my shelf, and uh, uh, I don't think it was called Warriors of the Wind. So anyway, okay. <clears throat> anyway, but Hero's Journey, this thing that um, many of us who have taken writing courses or have studied this on our own have heard of, and it's uh, you know it was coined by Joseph Campbell in I think it was in a Hero Hero with a Thousand Faces, right? I think so. Oddly enough. As much as I love Joseph Campbell as his lectures and whatnot, and uh, uh, one of his books, I have not read The Hero of uh, a Thousand Faces. Uh, I read it a long time ago. Yeah. Um, it's a pretty good book. I mean, so for those who don't don't know, Joseph Campbell was a scholar who did uh, studied comparative mythology, wrote this really well-regarded book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he was essentially saying, I mean, the title says it all, um, all of these different mythologies tend to tell Saying, well, he let me, let me put it this way. He noticed the similarities between all these different world mythologies and folklore and the kinds of stories they were telling, and he he sort of cataloged the various features that appear in all these different stories, and he called it the hero's journey. Um, I don't know. Is there any other preface that we want to give to that before we dive into ten thousand feet up? Uh no. I think I think that we're ready to go. We'll mention him a few times. I think. I think we'll talk about it a lot. We're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy of that hero's journey, that which I have on the screen right now. This circle with these different steps of a story. Um, but yeah, we'll go ten thousand feet up, and then we can talk about this uh, in a little bit more detail and why why we're so interested in this, especially right now. So I think, given that this is July twentieth, the anniversary of the Apollo eleven landing, okay, I'll this will be our trans transition music for power descent. Go. 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 10,000 feet up, where go. we back go. away and go. look at all the hidden complexities go. and Econ. dimensions go. of the topic. Why, the big why questions before we dig into the house. So, uh, all right. Where do you want to kick this one off, Rob? <laughs> um, okay. So we went into... Uh, this is funny. I actually, I, I'm a little bit on my heels as far as where, uh, so where were you thinking of starting? I, I actually, so well, did back you, okay. You. So, okay. So maybe, <laughs> so maybe we'll start by actually talking a little bit about this, um, hero's journey with the examples of, of stories that we were, uh, okay. Excellent. Talking Sound, about. Yeah. Gotcha. sounds really good. Um, so there's a, um, okay. Star Wars think about the some key points in that story you have um there's there's a let's see there's some kind of bigger political set of problems at play some people are in danger and then there's this this character just hanging out living his life and the hanging out living his life it's luke skywalker um and, and he gets kind of tied into all this at, at, a, at a certain point and that that's that's like the the whole beginning of of uh, a lot of these 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 heroes journeys are um well things were things were normal and all of a sudden now they're not right and uh then he gets he gets pulled into um well through a particular character a mentor um Obi-Wan Kenobi 
into this this uh um this bigger this bigger conflict right and let's see what was how re- was was luke would you say luke was reluctant or he was just kind of whiny about it <laughs> right um something so you mentioned in the notes uh a book that i wound up checking out today yeah called um the hero's two journeys by michael haig and christopher vogler or is it michael hoag michael hoag mm. and uh we'll link to it in the show notes it's an audio book um and it's 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 two hollywood screenwriters sort of like script doctors who like talk about they t- they talk a lot about Campbell's uh, hero's journey, and they sort of layer on some of their own structure along with it. And one of the things they say in one of their pieces, when they talk about the heroes and the hero's journey, they say, um, in the beginning of these types of stories, the hero pays lip service to their longing. Right? Here's Luke Skywalker. He says, "Oh, I, I want to go out. I want to join the academy and become a great pilot like my father and everything." And then the moment it's presented as a real option, the moment that the old man comes along and says like, hey, you should come with me and you can learn the ways of the force be a pilot. It's like, oh, I got all these excuses as why I really can't do that, right? I, I'm hearing <laughs> scary things. It sounds really scary. And I thought I wanted this, but this is too scary. And so he backs off. And then there's like a second push. And the second push is when he comes home and spoilers, right. his aunt and uncle are dead. And so now he has nothing left. And so... And that's yeah. like at, at some point when when home isn't an option, whether they're rash enough to actually like the it, who is it that that actually burns their cabin, right? So I re, or like I remember that was used in the store in um oh gosh, there was a um, an old anime called Record of Lotus War, right? Mm-hmm. Where literally the hero burns their cabin to mm-hmm. before they set out, and where that's they're kind of tricking themselves and being you know overly brash because you know hey hero card and um but that inter- that lip service thing is a really good point because it reminds me of the the like the beginning of the iron man movie when tony stark is um he's hanging he is being sort of chauffeured like he's accustomed to but it's but it's he's in like a military caravan right but he's like you know having a having a a, a drink and you know just being just being the um the brash uh jokey not take it too seriously thing but like he's in the middle of like um uh, it's almost uh, let's see it's like pay, he's paying lip service to this the seriousness of of um well being caught up in a real battle right mm. and then he you know, then he gets caught up in a real battle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, I don't, he doesn't really have a chance to refuse that one. Right. Where, where there's uh, th- like the, this, this hero's journey. like, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. In, I think, well, well, okay. We are talking about is that's not like a one formula thing, right? Obviously like can, there isn't sort of a insert character ideas turn the crank and out comes a script or an outline or what have you. Right. Right. Because you could use or not use any stage or for your own, you know, for your own purpose, obviously. But, but there is this kind of comfortable thing in consuming a hero's journey style story that, Mm -hmm. that like, I like, I find that pattern pleasing where somehow you're like, Oh, cool. Yeah. That's, I kind of like that person. Oh, that's their trouble. Now what are they going to do? Right. Oh, now we're in like the hour of dark despair, that kind of moment where everything falls apart yeah. for them and it seems impossible that they're going to solve the problem. How are they going to get out of this mess? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 I enjoy them a lot. I also enjoy very challenging, difficult art movies. You know, um, mm. there's lots of different things to enjoy, but this is like something that I think works really well for the types of movies that we've been watching this summer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's something that as, as, a, as a person who makes fiction for young people, and I know you're working on some fiction for young people or youngish people mm-hmm. um it's something that's very effective in that arena as well so yeah this was also like when you pitched this topic to me i was like oh this is kind of on my mind right now because i'm in the middle of writing two different comics uh that i'm probably going to be using a lot of this kind of structural thinking to compose my ideas um but anyway so yeah so like 
he's he's reluctant to go on the journey and he gets pushed on the journey and then like uh i remember joseph campbell even talking about this in one of his talks like the cantina scene is like all right things just got weird you just took your first step into this world and now look at you're in this room with all these weirdos before you go to the yonder shore right we're at we're at the, at the boat docks where oh, all those sure. weird sailors and and sea sea people are right um, who have all sort come from all sorts of different places, all sorts of different cultures, right? And now it's time to. It, this is like the the threshold to going into that magical world of outer space, right? Mm-hmm. And that's yeah, that that is a good point. So then then there's the whole um, well, you may not be going on this journey um, alone. Okay, maybe you have a mentor, maybe you don't. In the beginning, Luke happens to have Obi Wan Kenobi, but then uh, then there's the uh, there's potentially allies that help bring you across a threshold and, and get you into the next, this, this new magical world. And of course that's in the cantina scene has a lot of jobs in, in that story then where it's also, it's also connecting Luke with uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca. And then of course their means of travel, the millennium Falcon, which really isn't a character, but certainly has a lot of character, Mm -hmm. right? The Millennium Falcon is almost like a like a dungeon master, where it's like eh, maybe like it like it, it's a it's like a such a writer's tool where the writers are like you need a little more trouble. It's going to act up, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah get film. to get rolling. It's going to work great, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, anyway, this 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 um, there's so you can kind of lump some of these different stages into acts right so you can have act one where there's like a departure and uh moving on to the the initiation where all of a sudden maybe you you've you're starting in this into the into this next uh stage of your adventure and you have some allies maybe more enemies so i'm trying to think it's been a little while since i've seen star wars like what uh and, and i'm sure people are like what well, this is also this is also where you're point. learning the ropes, right? Like the initiation also means like, okay, you're in this new magical place now. It's time for you to learn how to actually operate in this world, right? And so True. You learn more about the force at this point, more but more practical, hands yeah. on. Yep. Yep. And then you build alliances, you start making friends. So like when Han mm-hmm. and Luke are in the Death Star and Obi Wan says, Okay, I gotta go. You guys hang out here, and then they start coming up with their own plan and start working together, right? Mm-hmm. Chewbacca, I'm gonna put these handcuffs on you. No, you're not. Han, you put them on him. Uh that kind of thing where like the relationships are starting to become more of real relationships mm-hmm. through. And then again, it's assembling of, of your allies. Cause now they're going to get the princess. So this is all part of that initiation sections, like learning the ropes and then building your alliances. Right. And, and, and encountering small ordeals that seem like, Ooh, that was tough, but it wasn't impossible. Nothing was impossible yet. Right. That's a good point. But that, and the ordeal section, I, I, I think, really was a quite a major portion of the movie because there were there were multiple ordeals as far as um the 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 group um exploring the the death star trying to rescue the princess getting you know getting trapped in the trash compactor and you know i mean there's parallel ordeals and obi-wan going through his ordeal and uh but then i mean i honestly it, it seems to like go on and on all the way through the the sort of um, the battle to destroy the Death Star, right? I mean, it seems to, it's almost like Star Wars doesn't go straight from like one ordeal and you get the, the, you you unlock this great capability that, and, and and potential outcome and, or have to make a difficult trade-off. And what's funny is that um, in sort of, because I read a few different books right around the same time. And I I sort of, glued different part like i they they kind of merged together in in a weird way because like one thing that stuck with me that i wasn't really finding in the in the sort of camp cambellian explanation of the hero's journey was was sort of that 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 trade-off the the sacrifice the um like because when you go into like just before the like the ordeal and the in the reward and when you get into you know um the return, you know, like before you, you sort of have to go back home, there's probably something you have to give up. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, this is like the death and rebirth. Right. And I suppose maybe that's what they, that's what they mean by that. Uh, 
the death is like you lose you lose something and it can be something that as, as i understand i should be i should preface that as i understand it the death part can be something metaphysical where it's like you acknowledge you have to give up some sort of persona that you are inhabiting. Like this is a construction of, of uh, psychological construction as a character I've created to protect myself from the world. Han Solo is a cynical swashbuckling thief. He's a scoundrel, mm -hmm. but in the end he has to give that up to prove that actually he, he does care about stuff and it, it just, you know, to help Luke. And then, uh, so he, he loses a little piece of, how dangerous he was at the beginning. He's not so dangerous mm -hmm. anymore, right? So something died. Like that Han Solo died and the new Han Solo is born. Or it can be something physical. Luke gets his hand cut off in Empire Strikes Back. A physical mm -hmm. thing you lost. It could be a talisman. Grandma gave me this thing, this thing I carry with me all the time and I've always had it and it represents this this connection I have to this family and in order to pass this, this threshold, that has to go, right? It could be something as simple as that. But in any case, something is destroyed and you were utter, you were very different somehow when you cross that threshold. Mm. Thank you. All right. So that, that, that is, uh, okay. So which it can literally be, um, a, we didn't, we didn't mention the matrix, but there's a, there's a bit of a, uh, a bit of a resurrection point in that mm -hmm. there's, uh, it, but so some of this, it, it can be literal. It could be like a, ch a big change in relationship. It could be um, like like some kind of expectation or assumption or worldview that has to just totally vanish. That's, um, but yeah, there is that big trade off. Um, and then then things are different after that. So like it's a, it, what's interesting is like that the whole model. It's like this. Uh, it, it it like the hero's journey seems like in a way it's it's just learning right it's it's a way to explain change and yeah you know what i mean like and i yeah. and i think that's one of the reasons why i i really enjoy it so much there's there's a recent episode of the you are not so smart podcast where um i forget what the topic was but he's talking about uh, our pattern recognition abilities i don't know if you listen to this one and he plays no, this garbled audio just like it sounds like complete utter nonsense i did it yes you did and then he yeah. warns you at the top, he says, like, okay, I'm about to say something, and when I say it, or when I, when I play this thing, you will never be the same. And then he <laughs> plays it, and he plays the sound that's embedded in that audio, right? And then, like, he plays the garbled audio again, and you can't help but hear it after that, right? So it's like, yes, the act of learning changes you. And I think, so it's like when some people say, like, well, audiences just like change. Well, do they always like change? I mean, yes, there are examples of stories where characters don't change. It's a different kind of story. Um, but I like your sort of framing of it as like it's it's a metaphor for the learning experience. We as learning creatures, and and the one thing that's so I think appealing about the the Campbell's um, heroic journey is mm -hmm. that it's a circle, it's a cycle, it's a cycle that we go through. And yes, this could be something that just comes from um, uh, association, right? We see circles all around us. The, the 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 sun and the moon are circles. They arc over top of our heads and go back down. They come back again, right? It's a, it's a cyclical thing. Um, but also, learning is a cyclical thing, right? You you go through the cycle every time you acquire a new skill. Oh, this is gonna be scary. This is gonna be really intense. Oh my gosh, this is terrible. I'm terrible. Hey, not so bad. That was awesome. Let's do it again. Oh my gosh, this is scary, right? <laughs> Each new thing. Uh, was that Kazu Kibuishi? Yeah, it was Ka Kazu Kibuishi's uh, yes. tweet on that that I quote all the yeah. darn time because it's so ex exact. It, it really is. It is. It is timeless and awesome. That uh, yeah, and th yeah, that is a journey. Like going, like crossing through this uh, a barrier of that that uh, crossing through a barrier that really will be a personal test for you and and maybe people that that are that are going with you and whatnot. And that that's where I think. Like even though like uh, a story like Star Wars can be so fantastical, so intermixed with things that uh, that that humans haven't achieved yet and what have you, that it it can it can still feel like so meaningful and and personal um, because we get we we sort of we we learn along with that with the character and how um and let's see I mean so you mentioned. We, we we learn along with Han Solo where where he has to let go of of that. Um, I mean, he has to become more caring and in a way vulnerable. And right, right, the caring was there, but he hid it. 
He hit yeah. it, right? He hit it with his, his persona that he developed in order to cope with the world in which he was living. And when he comes back for Luke, it's him eschewing that. He can't hide behind that anymore. He can't pretend to be tough, like a tough, callous, aloof guy after doing that act, right? That's a, that's a point of no return for him. So, um, Mm -hmm. And like you said in that example, which is a great, we'll have to link to the, that, um, that episode of the You're Not So Smart podcast, because once you, like you are changed, like once, what, what, what a fun example that you can hear this pattern that you could not have heard. You didn't, it would be very unlikely that you would have heard it before. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, another, another thing I like about the hero or hero's journey stories is, is the ones where, um, and a lot of them do this. They start with the status quo. The world works this way. This is the way the world works. And this is why I chose Monsters Incorporated, because it starts with, we are monsters. We make mm -hmm. our living as scarers. We scare people for a living, because what? why do we scare them? And this is a really, logically, this makes almost zero sense, but it's a fantasy story about monsters in another dimension. So it's like, it's easy to, to sign on, I think. Mm -hmm. um, we scare them and we collect their screens, which is our energy source. It runs our cities, right? Um, and then they set up a problem. Uh, it's getting harder and harder to scare children because they're beca we're entering such a cynical time. Kids, kids are being desensitized to scary things because the world is so awful, right? Which is another, like, that's a funny assumption. Uh, I, I would say that children 150 years ago had a lot of things to be afraid of, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, so then we, we have yeah. our premise. Like, our hero that we sign on to follow, Mike, or uh, James P. Sullivan, is like the best scarer in the whole world and he's he's got he's got his target he's got his his goal that he proclaims like i'm gonna go for the scaring record right i'm gonna i'm gonna hit that number and i'm doing it very very well uh and then called adventure happens little girl comes into their world right and then there's the premise they set where like even one touch from a child can kill you which is another one of those weirds like whoa where's where's your evidence of that that's odd and how did you discover that but um so now it's like put her back, put her back, all sorts of complications. But through and, and then like there's a point of no return. Like there's a point of no return in the story. And this is something they talked about in the Heroes Two Journeys, which I thought was an interesting uh, addendum to the heroic or the hero's journey. Is they talk about a point of no return where all your bridges behind you are burned. There's no turning back. You you are either um, closer to your goal than you are from where you started. Right, you're past the halfway point to your goal, or you literally cannot go back. And the point, have you, have you seen Monsters Incorporated, Rob? I have, yes. Okay. So that point is, is when Water News reveals that he's the bad guy and he pushes them through the door into the human world in there in the, the Arctic, right? So now, because like up until that point, they could hand the little girl over to Randall Boggs uh, pretend like they never saw anything and go back to the status quo of the beginning of the movie. But once they cross that threshold, right? Like once, once Water News reveals his, his motivation and pushes them to that door and they're in the Arctic, it's like they can't go back now. They have to see this thing through to the end, right? And of course, once you get to that point, there's like a moment of panic. That's when Mike Wazowski says like, we're done here. You're losing something, right? He's losing his best friend uh, because he has to see the thing through all the way to the end. Which is less of an emotional transformation for him. It's more of him like like. I think the emotional transformation happens earlier when he like starts to form affection for the little kid, mm -hmm. but um, but then the the truth of the beginning of the story is challenged when and this is where it's like I said it's very loud, but it's that's why it's a good example is when she laughs and turns on all those doors and they discover and it was because Mike was just being a, a, a fool right he was screwing up. Um, and then she laughs and they find out that l laughter is more powerful than the screen, right? Making people love you is way more powerful than making them afraid of you, which is a pretty awesome message anyway. But it's uh, what I like about it, too, is that that flipping of the understood truth of the story, right? And that's something that I think those those uh, heroes journey stories do a lot. I think so. And and I think we we often end up uh, forgiving uh, forgiving the story for having a premise that has um, that that just you know it wouldn't hold up to um, it because I don't know like there's a plausibility forgiveness and uh, you know like the, because they because it's meaningful it's it's almost like um, maybe that that forgiveness would cause a backlash if the story didn't sort of 
um, deliver on the promise of, of because in a way they're saying, well, th- just come along with me here. This is a meaningful, like we're doing this for a reason, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And it's it's like, yeah, okay, we we scare, we get energy from scaring, you know. Does that remind but, you of anything, you know, you know, motivating out of fear or whatnot, and yeah. come along with us, and and then and then there's a payoff because you're like, oh, okay, fine. Well, and then and then after this this transformation, after the 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 death of right because like after once they get pushed into the arctic it's like the idea of the record and james p sullivan following in water noose's footsteps is utterly destroyed his entire life as he knew it is over he can't like any plans that he had up till that point because the plan was put the kid back you know find her door put her back pretend it never happened but now there's no going back they can't do that so his entire the entire goal of his life has been shattered. So what do you do now? So now this is the death. This is the death of him. James P. Sullivan, top scare, is dead. Now he has to be James P. Sullivan, something else. Um, and that's when you come back with uh, the atonement and the elixir. And the elixir in the, the hero's journey is the good thing that you bring back into the world having undergone this perilous, terrible thing. And the elixir is the new understanding in that case, right? And the elixir can be something that's either... A physical thing it can be a talisman it can be like a powder it can be like a, a a magic sword it can be all sorts of things or it can be like a new a new way of living um one of the examples they use a lot in that book uh the hero's two journeys is actually the the movie titanic they talk about that a lot and about what the elixir <laughs> of that movie was um it's pretty interesting i never thought about titanic that much until i listened to this book so but well, that's funny. Yeah, I, I forgot that. It's it's been a good number of years since I've actually um, listened to the Heroes Two Journeys. But uh, again, the and and t- yeah, now it's Titanic. Um, let's see, that's a sufficiently old movie. Um, so what? So the the elixir would have been the. Is it? I guess what would the elixir be? the ex the um so the woman who's doing the, all the recollection she carries back with her like um like a a, a bigger uh, so the, there's the jewel but like it doesn't it represent her she throws the, in the end i'm going to spoil it everybody she throws the jewel into the ocean because that's not the elixir the elixir is that she led the life that she wanted to lead because of having met leonardo dicaprio's character right okay starts the movie and this is it's been a long time since i've seen the movie and i and i I don't think I could ever sit through it again. I can't she was watch a that bit many dour in the beginning or whatnot, right? She was she was not sort of she was like trapped. really she living. Was, yeah, she wasn't really living her life. She wanted a life of yeah. adventure, but then like when she meets Leonardo DiCaprio's character, he's like, "Well, here I am. I'm adventurous life." And she's like, "Oh, I don't know. That sounds like <laughs> a little bit uncomfortable." And then he, you know, like through their relationship, she you know gains more courage to try to take on this you know this adventurous lifestyle. And mm-hmm. then even like they were talking about how like the part when he's drawing her nude is like this is her like that's very symbolic of. You know, oh yeah, letting just, oneself bear before she's comfortable in one's own skin, kind of thing. Yeah, right, and so then by the end, even though she loses him, she's gained this new perspective that she takes into the world and leads. Yes, like so, the the, the elixir is her worldview itself, right? Right, right. Kind of thing. So, but in any case, okay. the the hero in these stories is is plotted by all these different scholars. They come out transformed. And not just transform, but they improve their surroundings somehow through that. That's, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's the whole promise that going through difficult matters is, is going to be worth it somehow. You want to believe that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a rewarding, um, it's a, it's a sense of, it rewards, I don't know, it encourages a sense of fairness and, and says like, yeah, okay, that might have been tough, but it it was worth it somehow. Right, which is, we're really good at that whole narrative thing of explaining like, oh, just, it's it, when one looks back on one's life, it's like, it's as if it was supposed to happen this way. It was destined to happen this way. And it's the thing that people will joke about TED Talks and pe- people and like it's there, there's a survivor's bias. Well, you know, this is my background. This is where I came from. This I can ex- explain this with such clarity and causality and a compelling narrative that this works somehow for everybody. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah, what works is the idea of of, well, using narrative to explain why things happen. <laughs> 
it's it's it turns out it's a really neat way to to encapsulate knowledge and um uh, to to sort of transmit feeling about experiencing change in knowledge and circumstance i have a very practical uh, example of this as as, mm-hmm. a, as somebody who teaches and i know we got to move on to the next section maybe mm-hmm. we'll close this and then maybe in the next section i'll tease this out um we're going to do maybe improv a story using this structure real quick do you want to try that mm-hmm. yeah yeah let's do that okay right. um but here's a here's an example of using narrative to teach i had a student in one of my comics classes this is a couple of years back and she was not engaging with any of the stuff that was happening in that class. She wasn't drawing anything. She would, she would show up every week, but she wasn't doing anything. She didn't even have stuff between classes that she would bring in to show me. She did not want to talk to me. She would just wanted to be there. And I thought, okay, she's getting something out of this class. But getting her to actually draw is exceedingly difficult. And I got to get to the bottom of this because nobody's going to leave my classroom without having a really positive experience with the medium of comics. And so after trying a lot of different things, uh, a, a really good friend of mine who does a lot of teaching recommended that I try this, and it worked. So I sat down, I told, I told her the story about how uh, when I was first starting out drawing, um, my parents thought I was really good, but that didn't mean that anybody else thought I was really good. So I didn't show a lot of my work to very many of my friends, and one day one of my friends accidentally caught me drawing in my sketchbook, and they saw what I was doing, and... Not only did they like what they saw, but they gave me a lot of great points on what I was doing wrong, and I got way better as a result of it. So sometimes sharing your work can uh, can open you up to potentially uncomfortable situations, but ones that will benefit you because you'll get some great tips. Um, the next week she showed up and she was drawing. Uh, so my, my friend correctly deduced that this was a kid who was paralyzed by praise needed to be told that failure is good because failure opens you up to, to leveling up. And I told a semi true story <laughs> about me struggling with this as well in order to give her the on road to, to trust that this is a, this is a safe place to, to operate. Right. So narrative, right. It wasn't, mm-hmm. even, it wasn't even hundred percent true, but it worked. So it's yeah, it, it's a, it's an incredibly useful thing in general obviously many many story formats uh exist and uh different sort of architectures and ideas for how you assemble story as you know whatever it's if whether it's a change you know like the you know road change of circumstance positive to negative and having some kind of arc and flow that way whether it's the hero's journey whether it's you know whatever there there's um there are formats like um you know hero's, hero's journey is, is like the you know the laser disc of <laughs> what we can put stories on. I don't know, like, <clears throat> and maybe uh, <laughs> I don't know, like maybe it's that laser disc, but <laughs> it's probably the what? Uh, it's probably something more timeless, like a uh, um, like a, a a city of statues and murals. <laughs> That could probably do something a lot more rich and timeless than than a laser disc, which, which would be hard to even hook up to a TV nowadays. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I really, I really should have come in and helped you because friends help each other. But uh, it was hey. it was really fun listening to you try to dig your way out of that one. <laughs> and, and and I'm I'm not out yet, but that's okay. Uh, I'll catch up. Keep going. <clears throat> Nothing to see here. <laughs> Nothing to see here. <laughs> oh, I'm sweating. Right I'm sweating, Rob. Belly, all right. Belly, it's belly, time for belly. us to take a break from uh, all this frivolity to talk about some of the people who make this show possible. Um, and those people have to be the, the folks who support us on Patreon. What is Patreon? Well, it's a thing kind of like a Kickstarter. But instead of pledging once to make one thing happen, this is pledging monthly to make a thing continue to happen, like this show. And uh, you can find our Patreon page at patreon.com slash leanintoart. And I want to take this opportunity to thank five people who have been supporting us there. First up, Jonathan Warrenson. Uh, I don't have a Twitter address for you, Jonathan, but if you want to share it with us sometime, we'd be glad to give you a shout out on the show. Jesse Kaufman, our good friend Jesse, who's been on the show a couple times now. Uh, you can find his stuff at Jesse Kaufman, K-A-U-F-F-M-A-N. And then Rachel Ross, 
longtime friend of the show, Rachel Ross, uh, can be found at N Y C T E R I S, like so you're like New York City Terrace on Twitter. Uh, the mysterious K. Thank you so much. We don't know who you are or what your real name is, but we appreciate that you believe in us and the work that we do. And finally, Owen Jolens at Comic Colorist on Twitter, uh, professional comic book colorist, also been on the show before. And if you want to check out patreon.com slash lean into art, you can find the shows that we produce. They're posted there, but also the extra leans, the shows we record in between the shows. They're for patrons only where Rob and I riff on topics and it's an open mic post where you can chime in with whatever you are thinking about at the time. And we want to thank everybody who has supported us on Patreon, patreon.com slash lean into art. Yeah, it's super meaningful. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. You want to fail in public? Why? Yeah, every day, man. Every day. I was practicing doing just minutes ago. So, um, what? Uh, so here we go. We have we have some characters that that uh, that have um, have a journey to go on. Yeah. Um, so do you want to? Okay, so let, let's just run through the structure real quick, and okay. then maybe we can start hanging some ideas on it. Cool. So, yep. Outline of the story. Act one, departure. You know, what happens in mm -hmm. departure? Like, this is where things start. This is like sort of like setting the stage or um, uh, set up. Set up for your story. What, 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 oh, uh, it's a language they used in that, again, in that uh, the Heroes Two Journeys book that I really liked was like, uh, I wrote it down. This is, this is my hero as of yesterday. Oh, yeah. And, nice and like, framing. Yeah, I like that a lot. Uh, and then also in this act is the call to adventure. Some some incident or invitation, maybe a refusal, maybe mentor meeting, uh, maybe it's something the hero's yearning for. But in any case, there's some some event happens that that in, uh, instigates desire on the part of the hero, right? Mm -hmm. then, then we move to initiation, right? Initiation. We talked about this. This is where like you encounter a little series of of tests, testing your power. Um, learning the ropes of this new magical world that you've walked into. Magical world doesn't necessarily mean fairies. Magical can mean a lot of things. Magical means strange. Magical means foreign. Magical means you, not the status quo. Um, you start amassing or collecting allies and possibly making some enemies. Um, this is where you become, uh, your persona is tested, right? This is the, the, the me I've constructed for myself to exist in this world, and maybe I'm getting some hints that that's not all there is to me. Um, and then there's an ordeal as this is, this is the death and rebirth, Rob. Yeah. And that's, it's likely amidst the ordeal or, you know, it, and from, from the, the ordeal to overcome it, it, it means that there is a, a death and rebirth. Yeah. Person's changed. Yeah. And then some kind of reward. Um, the reward doesn't have to be necessarily gold coins that pop out of the dead monster, you know? Sure, it's a loot drop, like in, like in the real world. Um, when you get promoted at work, it's like this weird floating, uh, glowing script hanging in front of you, right? <laughs> uh, yes, so it's just like uh, Scott Pilgrim. Or, yeah, honestly. Um, but then, then, having done that, you know, it doesn't just end there. Then you have to go home. You know, going home. Uh, going home doesn't necessarily mean going back to the the, the geogra geographical home. But going back, showing how the life of the hero is no longer the same. What is the new life that the hero is leading as a result of this, the, the death and rebirth? And, um, and also how the world is a little bit different through their journey, if possible. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you want to just start like hanging random ideas on this? We could. I have a, I have a proposal. Mm. So we could do a fan fiction mashup. Okay. Of you can take uh, Boulder and Fleet, right, from Adventures for Hire, and then you can take Pick and Crunchy from um, Art Geek Zoo: The Way of Sound. Okay. And this is this is the crew, right? So you could start in the Boulder and Fleet world, but then cause you know the magical world. They like either way, one one world's magic, one whatever. But but they they combine. What do you think of that? So you're, you're proposing a crossover. It's a crossover, yeah crossover event all right uh promoting our own books um uh, which i am i am not against uh, <laughs> well being the being the marketing tycoon that i am you know i really i planned this one out <laughs> not um, a bit. 
I just thought it might be there may be some sparks and energy there. Feel free to counter propose, but like like let's 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 have a premise and pick off from there. Like uh like one one option would be that mashup. What do you no, no, let's run with it. Let's run with it. Because, yeah, I don't want to spend a lot of time debating it anyway, but also it, it, it doesn't sound unappealing to me. Um, mm. All right. So where would that, where would, what would be a, a situation where we'd find them all in the same place? Um, well, I would imagine a musical might, might be a possibility. All right. So, could, yep. um, Adventures for Hire and Musical. Yeah, and, and, and we have to div establish a clear goal for whoever our main character is going to be. Um, hmm. A clear, visible, like visual goal, if we're going to do this as a comic. A clear, visual, visible goal. I would say, like, so what if, what if, um, what if Fleet had an aversion to a, a music, right? What if? Um, totally making this up. And then it's, uh, you know, Boulder and Fleet, as they do, they encounter things as they, they, they walk their, their land. And here you have, uh, a, um, a, a village of people who live through their, their music that, um, and that's just that's not something that fleet finds appealing at all but like maybe this should, this looks like it could be um lucrative right or something mm. okay. and yeah so okay okay yep i i, I see where you're going so like cool. so this is the, this is the, the pixar model of like once upon a time there was so and so every day that it's such and such one day this happened because of yeah. that this happened because of that this happened until finally that happened or exactly so once upon a time there was a bird named fleet who really um you know, was looking for well-paying jobs, but didn't like music. Uh, you know, every day they, you know, uh, they, 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 they did it. adventuring. They made more and more money, but not enough to satisfy her insatiable craving for for prestige and in luxury. Until finally, they are approached by somebody who says, "Boy, have I got the gig for you! Our village is being overrun, and it's it's a terrible monster and uh, very fierce, very very unpleasant." Uh, can you help us, please? Like, what are you talking about? Of course we can. I'm the fastest bird in the universe, and this is the strongest bear in the universe. We'll be there. They arrive. It is a town where everything is communicated musically. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So then we've got opportunity for refusal, or uh, you know, it's like uh, I'm paying lip service to this whole thing about wanting to uh, be the richest bird in the world, uh, but not like this. Right. <laughs> and this is something they talked about in that book again in the Heroes Two Journeys. They said, like, a great question to ask your character is they say, present their goal and uh, ask them, present the, have the character make the statement, I would do anything, absolutely anything to get to that goal except that. Right. And then what must happen? Yeah. That. Yes. So, so now what if, uh, essentially pick and crunchy are in this city? Like, this is like a, this is just like a loose place between worlds. Like, okay. you know, music is a kind of magic. And so here they are in, in, and they're, uh, maybe, maybe they're, they're like, this is a good place for a gig. And they're, they're, they're like performing at maybe a, oh, let's say a, uh, the, the, grand opening of a hmm grand opening of a thing that would cause a conflict <laughs> um grand opening of a thing that would cause a conflict yeah like, okay um whatever this mo i'm going with monster for now because it's simple and this monster. is the kind of thing where we're, we're brainstorming and this is first draft just to put yep. it in context um whatever this threat is this thing that's overrunning this town of musical people Mm -hmm. It is a creature that feeds on sonics, right? Mm -hmm. It's something where it 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 gains sustenance through aerial uh, aerial vibration, mm -hmm. and what better town for it to prey upon than that, right? 
And if Pick and Crunch are playing at a thing where it's going to be even louder than usual, that's going to instigate some kind of an attack, right? Here comes our first little test of these things. This monster or series of monsters, fleet of monsters, who knows? Mm -hmm. some, some kind of attack, right? Um, so now we have a chance for physical conflict. Um, mm. Tests. And then Golden Fleet, being who they are, would naturally come to assist, even though Fleet absolutely hates everything that's happening around her. Um, <laughs> the ordeal, I think, would have to be that f in some way, the defeat of this creature would have to require Fleet to learn how to play a musical instrument. They probably have to form a band. Yes. Yeah, they have to form a band. That's all there is like to it. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because Boulder would, of course, want to look for a peaceful solution, wouldn't want to actually kill the thing, but somehow, and this would be part of that problem-solving thing about developing a story, somehow, in the performing as a band, it solves the problem. Well, and, and so Pick and Crunchy have the kind of way to, like, they can turn music into different forces and um, help use that as a skill to defeat the the creature. So, so not only joining a band with them is, is well you know, a way to, to make, um, uh, a way, well, they have the way to battle essentially this, this thing that, it, that is a, let's see, let's, let's name, let's name the bad thing. It, it, it feeds off of sound. So it's probably, uh, it is, it is a, So we, I, I'm going between either robotic, alien, or super nasty creature. Because part part of me is like a tentacle of ears. Is is maybe, <laughs> right? Uh, anyway, uh, did I, that I'm cause a, anything? I'm 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 a fan of the supernatural kind of okay. monsters myself. Supernatural. So I, would, okay. I would think something where it's. It's a it's a bit eth ethereal eth eth ethereal uh, where it's maybe, like a or maybe you know? maybe Cthulhu ish you know it's like some kind of, some kind of tentacles thing but maybe not robotic tentacles but I'm imagining mm -hmm. something like something with creeping creeping form big icky thing um, oh gosh I I you know the idea occurs to me that it'd be cool if it came from a place where there was no sound right um, and so then like maybe it's, there, there can always be that one of those you get what you wish for moments where fleet is taken to its place it's oh sure yeah during the battle then uh the the creature needs to or let's see so somehow in the conflict yeah fleet ends up in this in this sort of um vacu vacuous zone of maybe maybe it's nothing but money and quiet right <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing but money quite, i don't know it's so that could be like a really heavy duty thing to to make to make a choice about like or 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 it could be the thing that changes the perspective of the beginning of the story where it's like well this thing just eats sound well maybe if we make enough sound we can satiate it and we'll go mm -hmm. right that that's the the pacifistic urge to pacify right like let's, let's pass sure. this thing um so the, silence is the answer right so, oh where it seems obvious that well this is a musical town musical characters of course we have to make sound but what if silence is the answer and and then there's like something in the in the, the i'm trying to work in some kind of death for a character's point of view um and this is feeling really forced and shoehorned so i'm just gonna throw it out horn it just and then we can always we can always throw it away if it doesn't work but i'm just thinking about like is there a, is there like a parallel metaphor here for the cacophony of desire, like the the frantic urgency of accomplishment, right? I, I want to be the most famous and the most rich, and I just got to mm -hmm. keep fighting for it. I got to keep fighting for it. And like, uh, in the end, there's a thing about like finding that center and finding that silence and calming oneself down. That's the way that one, that, that sometimes that's required to solve problems, right? Mm. Uh, now, see, now I'm making myself nervous because now I'm falling on thematic instead of visual event. And okay. This okay. This is something I do a lot, and it's one of my weaknesses, and it slows me down when I'm writing, because I keep going. Well, it needs something that feels like this. No, just come up with visual events and concrete things for them to do, and then you'll discover the thematic stuff later. So, pause that. Push it off the table. 
Uh, no, I, 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 I would, I would yes and it, you know, where there's a, um, let's see. So recognizing the value, like, like having an assumption, having to break it, having to then say that, well, it wasn't entirely wrong is like, I mean, that's, it's almost like a, that that's an interesting hard problem for a character to deal with. And, uh, so what if, if they essentially are able to, mm, I don't know, this makes no sense, right? So I went straight, I, I went away from thematic to like, this is a funny idea. So what if they record their performance and they give it to the creature? <laughs> <laughs> they give it an iPod. <laughs> yeah, they give the creature an iPod and some headphones. I'm like. Why don't you take these back to your? Because actually, yeah, if you're if you're an animal that eats sound, that would be the perpetual food machine. It would be the horn of plenty. Up oh, there's the title. <laughs> I love audio puns. Okay, <laughs> I I feel good about this. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so like. Working in the, the character moments of like what like we came up with like basic like plot of like a really loose plot, but like what would be the death and rebirth? What would be the reward elixir? Um, and you know what? Here's another thing that I think is worth underlining. Hmm. We don't necessarily have to do those things, right? This is a we don't. Work. What's funny is like you literally could make a, a hero's journey um, about someone avoiding their call to adventure it could be that could literally be most of it and then you could make the rest of it, it, it like um moments within one scene <laughs> and then it all plays out there so like let's see what do we what would be an interesting um maybe we could <laughs> so we did our we did our improv exercise yeah, and I'm th I'm trying to think of like what's what's a question we have about this, or some some final thoughts. Mm. What are some final thoughts based on? This? Yeah. Um, ah, okay. Mm. I think we kind of were heading in this direction with our, with the, the previous thought is um, is is this? Let's examine like the usefulness of this is this simply just a mechanism to help generate or organize ideas is this something where it's like because like one of the things that i will say that that book one more time to talk about that uh the hero's two journeys <laughs> one of the people in on the team uses the word always a lot you know like every good story always has this in it um it's not gonna surprise yeah. anybody what, what our position on that kind of prescription is, but maybe talk a little bit about that because um, hmm. there is that notion of the the rules and breaking them. Knowing the rules is important so that you know how to break them effectively, right? Um, so. So, like what, it's almost like your favorite. Well, did you just load a page or something? Because you get like super choppy. <laughs> did I? Uh, you know what? I... I did. So, whoops. I'm back. But and then and then also, I mean, are we talking about something necessarily where you always have to be teaching? Um let's talk about that too. As our final thoughts. What do you think? I like it. Okay. Challenge always be teaching and every need to think. All right. So, um <laughs> Joseph Coco says Horn of Plenty is the perfect title. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, that that was that was that was, that was a, a happy one. accident. Mm -hmm. Um but that's you know, that's what some of the best writing is. All right, so in, in a couple minutes we're going to conclude with our final thought on this whole heroic journey thing. At least final thought for this week. This is a weekly show. We don't have to come up with a definitive answer every time. We, this is an exploration. This is a perambulation. This is walking around an idea. This is not necessarily coming down with a stamp and saying, here you go, everybody, finish thought. Now you don't have to. This is so you will too. So anyway, before we do that, um, we got to talk about some other people who make the show possible, and those people happen to be who, Rob? Us. That's right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, when you make a comic, 
and I make a video game. So honestly, supporting our projects helps, uh, well, helps keep this project going, right? Well, and uh, we mentioned Patreon earlier, but then you may be like, well, what else do you folks do? And that's, yeah, that we would love for you to check these things out that we're about to share with you. Yeah, this is this is evidence of the of the uh, the expertise that we have, right? And the, the, we think hard about this stuff, and then we put it into practice. So the thing that I put into practice is I make comics, and uh, I have a comic that we've just been talking about called Boulder and Fleet. If you were wondering all that time, like what the heck is a fleet? What is a boulder? Um, boulder is a bear, and fleet is a bird, a little yellow bird, and a big strong bear, and they are best friends, and they are adventurers for hire. And uh, it's uh, cute animals and funny stories with, like, hopefully some real threats and some real danger, um, but mostly about friendship and eating cake and having a good time. And you can find it at boulderandfleet.com, and there's even, if you're really interested, there is a Patreon for it. It's at patreon.com slash jersey, where you can see behind-the-scenes stuff. I've been sharing a lot of in-progress stuff on some uh, pieces that I've been working really hard on. Rob, you make a game. I do. Uh, th it's a game called uh, "This Panda Needs You." It's a it's a um, it's a mellow block stacking game meant for um, all ages, especially you know the the young crowd. But uh, the idea is is you have a you have you are presented with an arrangement of blocks that becomes a puzzle because these blocks get all messed up when a cloud comes along and and blows them away, and uh, and then there's this little panda there, you know, needing your help to put things back to the way they were. And so you're 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 dealing with the, the the physics of the block stacking and the and the pattern matching and there's like there's like over fifty levels of that but it's it's a very mellow game the panda dances as you make progress and is all encouraging and and it's just um it's meant to be like a just a mellow delight and uh, you can learn more about it and uh, find a link to the iTunes App Store where it is at this panda dot com and i am working on getting it out to more platforms as well but right now it's on your it's for your iphone and your ipad and if you purchase it for your iphone or your ipad and if you haven't done this yet please give it a five star review that helps more people find it um, but let's say you're here because you know you, you don't really necessarily care that much about the stuff we make you just like the way we think that is that's very flattering uh, it, I'm not offended by that at all. And as a matter of fact, we have more products based on the ways that we think at leanintoart.com slash workshops where you can download videos at a price of your choosing, even zero. You can download it for free. And if you find it useful, then you can come back and you can sort of purchase it again. That's a way of tipping us for making a thing that you found, you know, useful and effective. And if, you, um, if you've done all these things, you supported us on Patreon, you've read our comics, you've played our games, you've downloaded our workshops, a great thing you can do right now that costs you nothing is giving this video a thumbs up if you're watching it on YouTube or if you're listening to an audio podcast version of this, you can go to whatever podcatcher you choose and give the show a five-star rating that raises our relevance in search, helps more people find the show, brings more people into the group so that they can help make the show more sustainable too. And we thank everybody who has intera interacted with all the things we just talked about. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. All right. Time for the final thoughts. Um, yeah, here we go. You know, okay, so can we... Can we Maybe dig at that little bit, a little bit, uh, you know. Oh, oh, did you want to talk about a book we're working on? Is that what you want to talk about? Well, I there's that you... too. There is, there is that. I mean, that we've, um, there's, there's a lot of who knows improv. No, you, you just dropped it. So here we go. All right. <laughs> so guess what? We had it. We had a teaser totally went in, in a, in a different direction. Um, this like, game. The exercise that we just we demonstrated, right? This there is a much more refined version of that. Maybe maybe you have been uh, a leaner, a listener of the podcast for quite some time, and you might recall something that we explored for I, th I think at least twelve months or somewhere in there is um, the Lean Into Art quests, right? So we had these like creative mini creative challenges that like out the outcome of this creative challenge was uh, you you made a thing. So now, well, what if there was a book that we created that helped you get going with making a comic? Yeah. Yep. Whole so, book. More to come. But yeah, we've been working hard on that for uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a while now. Mm -hmm. But um, basically a book that, that sort of prompts you to generate ideas and assemble them, construct them and in, in, in semi-mysterious ways, I would say. 
okay i'm double down on this okay so the magic that you hear jersey do and he describes as far as what he does in the classroom and how um like pulling out the uh i mean just just qualities of a of a of like how would you define and like an, an, an interesting cast of characters and how could you uh not get caught up in too many problems and entanglements and whatnot and like get a thing finished quickly to just you know for the practice and the exercise maybe generating like the thing you want to make next and those kinds of um well expertly facilitated exercise or what you can find in that book right so and it's like you know it's 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 a lot of jersey magic but <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of you um but yeah it, I'm, I'm excited about it it's just a little bit more work to go on it and then we can release it into the world um, mm -hmm. and in part it's nice to just mention because we've teased it a tiny bit here and there and really obliquely here and uh and i and it, as i would i did i put it together put together a few notes for this this episode i was like in a way doing that improv exercise is like a um it's a form of some of the things that that we we have in that book so yeah it's it, it it's a good time to mention it there's so a good time to mention more that. to come more to come so you can pay attention at um patreon.com slash lean into art is where we would probably drop any early mentions of drafts of this thing mm -hmm. pieces of this thing indeed great yeah. place to go all right well did we did did we walk around this i think we did a little bit right I'm going to say like, let's, let's like one tiny extra bonus thought on like, um, the closing question that we hinted at before the drop in the book was, um, almost like the always be teaching. Does every story have to have that, right? The, the, the hero's journey is, is, a, you know, did we just ruin it by saying, Hey, it's learning. Yeah. It's not all swords and magic. It's, 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 it's ideas and and like no and and as, discovery. as, as again as the, the 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 two journeys book uh talked about one of the things they said that i thought was really a lovely way of putting it is they said sometimes the author wants the audience to help them figure out what the ending was sometimes uh it's meant to be more interactive and more ambiguous and it's not meant to be a, a didactic moment sometimes it's uh it's a collaboration between artists and audience and it's not just the the sage and the stage and sometimes it's just about cool dragons you know and that's enough um, for me i i've said for years that i like thinking about this structure as first of all just like a cool intellectual exercise noticing patterns observing things that i see around me and and noticing the connections between them but also when i'm stuck when i'm stuck of like i don't know where to go next I can pull down that chart and go like, okay, well, this is like, you know, a really interesting framework. What if I just started putting some details here, here, here? Oh, suddenly I've got like, I, by restricting myself, I'm forcing myself to make more immediate decisions that help get me rolling again. And then put the chart away, the chart's gone. Now I'm back to just being a creative person again. So that's that's a really good point because it it, it can provide that service of uh, like like eh, almost like a map where okay here's some territory i'm going to i'm going to take a path through this map and it was neat to see it because i it helped me draw that the you know that sort of outline pretty quickly but now i've really got to figure out what are the steps on this path and like those moments and tying them together and whatnot that's that's a, that's a job of me writing not 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 a general structure and and we demonstrated that when we got to the point when i said well we don't really have death and rebirth or an elixir here and then the thought immediately occurred to me like maybe we don't need it um i'm not saying that that story was so well developed that we didn't need it but that was an interesting <laughs> question to ask maybe this is a story where that doesn't happen but time to figure that out that kind of thing absolutely so all right now now i really think we walked around it okay good all right, this show is recorded every week on Thursday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central Time, um, and is streamed live on YouTube at leanintoart.com slash live. That's where you can find the live streams uh, every week. 
and uh, it's archived at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. But if you want to participate live, you get to hang out in the chat room. We do watch the chat room and respond as best we can. Um, that's your way of getting to the, the actually, you know, ask questions of us while we're hashing out the ideas and being part of the discussion. Um, but we're also happy to talk with you on Twitter and Instagram and all the other social places too. Um, mm -hmm. So until next time, thank you, Rob, for this discussion. Thanks everybody for hanging out with us and downloading and listening. Uh, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user leanintoart, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. All right. I'm going to shut off the stream. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. Yeah, thanks for hanging out.